Thank you very much, Caroline. That was amazing. It was uh, great to hear from you in person. Um, okay, so seeing as this is the graveyard shift, everyone's feeling a wee bit full after having your lunch and the fringe events. I'm wondering if you could indulge me and we'll do a little Mexican wave. So starting from the front, going back the way. Are you all ready? Get rid of your phones and things. Stop tweeting now. Okay, after three, one, two, three, go. <laughs> well done, well done, Margarita. <laughs> that was excellent. Okay, so we're going to have a wee question and answer session now. And you'll notice that we've got uh, Mr. John Finney, MSP, here as well. He also needs no introduction, and he has already been introduced to you today. Um, he was a police officer before he went into politics, and uh, he shares my love of dogs. Does that also extend to Patrick Harvey as well? Yes, yes, yes. Deep good. Affection. Deep affection, good. Okay, so I'm going to ask for you to come to the microphones that are in the middle of the aisles here, one and two. Um, if anybody has any access issues and can't, let us know. We will get a microphone to you, but it'll be easier if we can get people to come up. So I'll call you in pairs and we'll take two questions at a time and then we'll put them to Caroline and to John to, to answer for you. So I, am, I have to put the glasses on, yes, not just to look intelligent, but also so I can see who I'm pointing at. Okay, so there's a lady at the back there. Yep, standing up. Would you like to come forward to this one? And somebody from this side? At the front? Yep, perfect. Gentleman down the front. Thank you. If you come up to the microphone as well. I'm Linda Hendry from Stirling. And my question is about whether Caroline and also Mr Finney, now that I know that he was in the police, is the Scottish Green Party right to hide its excellent drug policy under a bushel as the policy that must not speak its name? And should we pull it out of the PRD document and give it a shake at the next election? And we'll take the second question just now and then we'll answer both. Thank you. Um, in the dreadful political culture that we have at Westminster, a very macho male-dominated, public school-dominated, upper-middle-class and upper-class-dominated chamber. Um, how can one or two or ten or twenty Green MPs change that culture but be careful that it doesn't change them? Okay, well, we'll start with you, Caroline, if that's okay. Yeah, I'll take the second one first because I've got a short memory. So um, the question about how do you change the culture at Westminster? And I guess although everything that, that you've just said and that I've said about, about the macho culture and the elitism is all true, it is also possible to work cross-party to try to get things done. And I must say that was one of the more positive things that surprised me, in fact, probably the only positive thing that surprised me uh, about Westminster was that there is much greater capacity to work cross-party to make things happen. And it has led to some quite odd relationships. Um, Douglas Carswell, before he was in UKIP, when he was still a Conservative MP, I worked very closely with him because he wanted to see on the ballot paper, as did I, not just a choice between first past the post and the uh, alternative vote, but a genuinely proportional system. So we worked together on some common amendments for that. I've worked with some of the Liberal Democrats on environment. I've worked with some Labour people on other issues, worked with the SSMP on some issues. So it is possible on, on concrete issues to try and get things done. And there is also a cross-party group under the leadership of Michael Meacher, which is a, a, a kind of a, a reform group. Now, there's only 10 of us <laughs> out of a parliament of 650, so it's a small group. But we are slowly trying to change some of the things about parliament and making some small steps forward. I mean, for example, some of the sitting hours now have changed so that on a Tuesday night and Wednesday night, you no longer have to sit until 10.30. It's a small step, but we're, we're keeping them. Um, we're, we're, we're continuing those steps. And how do you make sure it doesn't change us? Well, I've got some staff that will always bring me down to earth very, um, very strongly, and indeed the rest of the Green Party, so I don't think there's any chance of any of us getting too, um, too, too native on the inside. The first question was about drugs, and um, I don't know if there's a debate going on in the Scottish Green Party, and I don't want to kind of you know, step in where, where, where you know, angels might fear to tread. But I can tell you about what I've been doing on drugs policy at Westminster, because actually, I think our policy, if it is 
properly framed about being led by the evidence is, I think, incredibly um, popular. It's, it's, it's actually very helpful. Even the Daily Mail, for goodness sake, has, has been fairly positive about the idea of saying that prohibition is not working. Let us take an evidence-based, step-by-step approach that would see, ultimately, I think, a regulated drugs scenario. Um, and obviously, you have to be very careful about how you describe that and discuss it. But what I discovered in Brighton, which when I was elected, had the very unwanted title as the drugs death capital of Britain. It was the place where more people were dying of heroin overdoses than anywhere else in the country. When I was elected, I thought, I want to try and help and do something about this. And we convened a drugs commission in Brighton and brought together some national expert on drugs policy, some local people, drugs users, families of drug users, um, you know, some of the service organizations that work with people taking drugs. And we came up with some really strong and effective um, uh, recommendations. So I think that this policy can be incredibly, well, it is incredibly important, certainly, and I think we don't need to be afraid of it. I think that when you can demonstrate that it means cutting um, the, 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 the prison population massively, it means saving money, it means saving lives, it means treating drug addiction as a health problem, not as a criminal problem, I think all of that is actually really healthy. And when you start talking about drugs, you find so many people know someone or have someone in their family who's had a drugs, drugs problem. And simply criminalizing it, I think, drives it underground, it stops people becoming healthy again, and I think is absolutely the wrong way forward. So I think my answer to your question is probably get it out from under the bushel. Okay, well, um, Scotland's blighted by drug abuse. It's completely blighted by drug abuse. Accident emergency units are jam-packed with the consequences of that drug abuse. Of course, the drug abuse of choice in Scotland is alcohol. Um, and I think if we were to get the chance to decide what was going to be criminalized, um, it perhaps would be that rather than um, criminalizing some of the, the people who have been criminalized as a result of the Misuse of Drugs Act and other acts. Um, wh what has to be at the, the forefront of all our considerations is what's best in the interests of the um, citizens we're charged with representing. And there's no doubt that the present policy has failed miserably. I got given a gift of uh, uh, the front pages of a satirical magazine from America, which I'd never heard of, called The Onion. And it's got some, some of you know it, it's, uh, it's a, a very interesting publication. And this was a front page from the 1970s, and the front page headline said, Drugs Wins Drugs War. Um, and you have, to, you have to reflect on whose interests are being served with the present arrangement. I care deeply about people and I, I care about the approach that's taken in relation to people making informed choices about everything. So just as I said in my very brief um, discussion on the justice portfolio, I, I, I'm at the moment a member of the uh, representing the Green Party on the ministerial grouping that's looking at uh, new psych psychoactive substances. Now, all of my colleagues are very, very clean that we call it that, or it's got a new name, Novo uh, Psychoactive Substances. It's, it's known as legal highs. And people get very excited if someone wants to spend £22 in a bath salt and self-harm um, and uh, plant food. And of course, uh, there is a challenge about trying to chase the, 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 the people who provide these grubs. I, I want informed choices to be made. Unfortunately, people want to look at ways of uh, closing down the, these shops. Um, they want to misrepresent statistics and the most, uh, how can I put it, offensive misrepresentation of statistics can often relate to methadone, which is a method of providing harm reduction and um, the, the fact that it's available in uh, drug-related deaths, and similarly, new psychoactive substances. Um, of course, what's often missed out is it's polydrug use. People aren't just taking one thing, they're taking a range of things, and in almost without exception in drug-related deaths, alcohol is present. Um, so I think there's a complete imbalance, and the imbalance is far too much in the realms of enforcement. It's, a, it's big business for my former and colleagues, and one of them took grave exception to me saying in the Parliament, if any of you saw the recent debate, um, about the uh, availability of drugs. Because guess what? You know, when I was doing things, a £10 bag was readily available for people. You could still get a £10 bag, it's readily available. And he intervened to say, yes, but the quality's not so good. That's the level of intervention. <laughs> now... You know, I, I, I think we want an educated population. We want a population that's safe. They, they, they should make informed choices, and that won't happen unless we change. So I'm for taking the policy out and having a look at it.
So we take another couple of questions. Hands up. Okay, so I'm seeing the lady down here in the green and the gentleman in the, yeah, that one, yeah, in the t-shirt. If you come to this microphone. Thank you. Okay. Hi, uh, my name is Helen. Um, I joined the uh, Scottish Greens shortly before the independence re referendum last year, and as you can see, I still wear my colours on the sleeve. Um, but um, I grew up speaking to people, and I've been voting for the Green Party for very, very many years, but every time I speak to people about it, they often say, well, we agree with the Greens, but we don't think it's realistic to vote for them. And although we are getting this year-on-year -year increase in the Green membership, it, it always seems to be the case that when people get to the ballot box, they get cold feet and they just say, we can't, we, can't, we won't waste our vote, we're terrified of this. Caroline, you managed to make this change in Brighton from people just believing in the Greens to people really pushing for that Green vision to happen. How do you suggest that the rest of us make that jump? Thanks, Helen. <laughs> and the gentleman here as well. Hi, hello, Brian Crystal from Edinburgh. Bearing in mind that year in, year out, the world population increases by 80 million each year, 12 to 13 years to put a billion people on the planet. If everybody is to have the same opportunities I have, the same resources I have, do you think 10 billion people, another 3 billion added to the planet by the end of the century can live sustainably? Thanks, Brian. So we'll ask John to go first on those. You can ask, answer both or one. Well, we'll go on that, that last um, quick question there from Brian. Um, there are many challenges the planet faces. There, there, there's more than enough to go around. There's plenty food for everyone. This is an inquiry. There's a huge imbalance, and it's an imbalance of power. It's, I mean, we see it in Scotland as well, the, 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 the difference there is in levels of poverty, fuel poverty, um, general poverty. I don't see um, the issue of um, world population as being as significant as some people see it. A lot of people um, have large families in the third and de the developing world for a, for a reason. And, uh, you know, I heard a lecture a number of years ago by a guy um, who was a climate change denier, Bum Lomborg, if some of you have, have heard of him. And, and you know, if Scotland, if Scotland and the UK and the developed world to, were want to be effective, we would cure malaria when we cure AIDS and would provide resources uh, for uh, sub-Saharan Africa. Um, I, don't, I don't see that as being an issue. There, there's plenty to go around, and I think we know that from experience in the developing developing world that um, you know, family sizes do alter over time. I'm certainly not for engineering society in that way. Um, but it is a challenge. It's, it's certainly a challenge, and it's a challenge that ha has been um, overcome. And if, if, I, if I speak about the Scottish National Party, it, it had a, a, a long, a long uh, um, run up to a point where it had the, the level of um, electoral success it did have. And indeed, even in the 80s, it looked like there was a downward spiral. People can be persuaded to a cause. I think the uh, the, the challenges people think were nice. Um, and they think, but we don't have the way of doing things, that it's a bit twee. Well, I'll tell you, you know, if, if you were at Longanet Power Station, as Patrick talked about, you would want to know that your government had a plan, and a plan to address things. Now, Scotland's new economic future is, um, as the report that was commissioned by the Green MSP shows, it is in decommissioning. And we need to get on with it, and we need to, we need to get in there quick. The Brent oil field, what, just one example, um, the 98% the of the rig that's going there, it's going to take years to dismantle, is actually going to Teesside. They'll be making washing machines out of it. There's 10,000 kilometres of uh, um, pipeline to be decommissioned in the next 30 years. The skills are interchangeable. If we make it apparent to people that the benefits uh, are there. The, the fear is that we are going to have a, 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 an economy where jobs aren't important. There are more jobs. And the, the issue of energy, I think it's um, the interconnectors between the, the islands and the mainland, the challenges of that. We've seen how these big companies have fettered communities. If communities see an individual benefit, I mean, I, I think, for instance, in, in Orkney, when I was up there, um, there was a challenge getting the power off the island, and they were looking at ways of changing the power. This was from the, the community uh, turbine, and they were going to turn it into heat and uh, um, have hothouses 
I learned that they grow pineapples in Iceland. I didn't know that when I was up there. Um, and the opportunity for that to be a, a community-based company employing local people, if people can see a tangible benefit in that scale, and the aggregate effect of all of these communities across uh, the rural areas, of course, not just simply in the rural area, not a million miles from here in Neilston, it's a very innovative community there in the way they go about things. So it is making things uh, real for people rather than, as perhaps in the past it was seen as being theoretical and very scientific. Caroline, how do, how do we make, make them believe that it's not a wasted vote? This is something we do here all the time. I think it's about some pretty ruthless targeting, to be honest, and then getting people elected. I mean, the way that I was able to be elected in Brighton was thanks to immense work by so many people over so many years in Brighton, standing first of all as the sole local councillor, and then they got three, then they got nine, then they got, you know, it kept going up, and then you became to the point where you started to become, I think, Keith. Uh, Taylor was, was, was third in the general election before the one that I won, but he had you know, come, come up to, to, to third there ahead of the Liberal Democrats. And so it, was, it becomes something that becomes possible. So I, I think it's, it is about having to target resources, certainly under first-past-the-post elections, pretty um, ruthlessly, so that you can demonstrate that you've already got the council base, that you've already got you know, more Greens, as it was in, in the constituency of Brighton Pavilion. There were more Greens elected from that constituency in the local council than from any other party. And when you start to demonstrate that and demonstrate the reality and the effectiveness of Green Party politics in, in, in practice, then people do become persuaded. And so I think it, it is about you know, identifying when it is a first-past-the-post uh, election to identify where your targets are and taking a hit elsewhere. And that's a big thing to ask people to do. And I know that when we made Brighton Pavilion the target in 2010, you know, it meant that other people were having to not campaign quite so hard in their constituencies and actually coming down to help us in Brighton. And I'm hugely, hugely grateful to that, for them to that and, uh, and will certainly re re repay the favour. But I, I think under this system, until we manage to break through under this system, um, that's, the, that's what, we, what we have to do. Um, I was going to come back to the, to the population question to say that I do think population is an important question, but of course it isn't just a question of numbers, it's a question of consumption patterns as well. And that's why population is as much an issue for rich north countries as it is for some of the poor southern countries. So of course in the south, as John said, many people are having large families because it's an insurance policy, because they know that because they are living in such poverty, several of those children probably won't make it to adulthood. So part of the issue is around ensuring that every single woman who wants access to family planning gets it. And the idea that you know, previous to, um, uh, US presidents have actually withheld financing for that, I think is absolutely criminal. So we need to make sure that women have the right to family planning. We need to make sure that in the South, women in particular are the focus of development strategies to make sure that global justice movements are focusing on women and we, we begin to, to, to get rid of the poverty in, in, in poorer countries. But as I say, it isn't just a question for the South, it is a question for us in the North because you know, if all of us are eating a meat-based diet, then it's going to be an awful lot more difficult for us to be sustainable with 10 billion people that we won't be sustainable than if we are not eating a meat-based diet. And there are several other changes that we can make to our consumption patterns that will lead to a more just world, I think. Okay, are you feeling um, like you'd like another little Mexican wave? Shall we go for it? Shall we try a side-to-side -side one this time just to get you energised again? So we'll start over this side. So all the way up. We're going to have to coordinate this one a wee bit better. After three, one, two, three, go. Go back again, go back again. Well done. Is that the Falkirk branch I can hear there somewhere? <laughs> Woo! Okay, so we'll take another couple of questions. Who have we got? Who have we got? It is very dark out there. I can see you waving. Yes, you were in the last one before, so you come down. Have we got a lady there? Yes. With the glasses, yeah, sitting close. Who can get there first? Go. <laughs> Um, you were talking about cross-party working in Westminster, Caroline. Um, I was just wondering what other successes you've had in changing the culture and getting forward, putting forward good policies and actually getting them passed. Yeah. 
You mentioned in your talk the 90 companies that are responsible for a majority of greenhouse gases. And uh, you mentioned that we need to move towards renewables for supply. Of course, the people running those companies, they have an absolute duty to keep those companies going. And the only way they can do that is by taking it out of the ground. So what framework do we need in place to stop those companies and to keep it in the ground? And how do we give that the impetus to succeed against the huge resources that will be arrayed against us? Well, thank you for on that second question. It seems a perfect opportunity to give a shout out. Wasn't it Glasgow University that did some brilliant things with the divestment campaign? So fantastic to Glasgow for that. Leading the way on this as on so much else. Um, but seriously, I do think that the divestment movement, the movement that is persuading pension funds and others to take their investment away from fossil fuels is one of the most exciting movements that is around today. And the universities are in the forefront of that, young people are in the forefront of that. I'm also trying to get the parliamentary pension fund to um, even just to tell me actually where the pensions are invested. That is our first hurdle. They're not telling us that yet. Um, but I've got an early day motion down in Parliament to try to um, both get that information and assuming that our pension fund, like every other pension fund, is heavily invested in fossil fuels, uh, to get uh, the, that to begun to be, to be disinvested. So if you can be bothered to uh, write to your MPs to get them to sign that EDM, that would be incredibly helpful. Because it is about taking the power away from those big companies and giving it back to communities. And if you look at a country like Germany, they don't have a big six energy companies. They have 60,000. And they have those because they have policies that promote community energy. You know, if we wanted to do this stuff, if we had politicians worthy of the name in Westminster who were not just lackeys of the big six, who, but who genuinely cared about this, they could change the policy framework to make community energy the backbone of renewable energy in this country. And it would be a wonderful challenge to those big six, which is exactly why the big six are fighting it so hard. So make no mistake, inside the Department for Energy and Climate Change right now, there is a huge battle going on between different interests. And the trouble is that as a result of some freedom of information requests that I put down, we revealed just how many of the big six are actually inside the Department of Energy and Climate Change on secondments, providing their expertise, that's generous people they are. Um, to, to, so, so what they are actually doing is drawing up the future policy, um, which unsurprisingly favors them. So we have to challenge that, we have to call that out, we have to make sure we have the politicians in there who will put in place a very different policy structure. And it's perfectly possible given the political will. And I think the divestment movement is a brilliant way of demonstrating that political will and hopefully giving our politicians a bit more spine when it comes to this subject. So I'm so excited, I forgot the first question. <laughs> um, the quest, first question was about, about um, su su any successes in terms of um, cross-party working. Um, I was going to j just tell a, a small and a slightly scary story about the fact that the vast majority of MPs at Westminster have no idea what they're voting about. It's a little bit scary. The bell goes for a vote, and you've got eight minutes to get from wherever you are on the parliamentary estate to the chamber to go and cast your vote. My office is some little distance from the chamber. I'm sure that's entirely coincidental that they've put me about as far away as they possibly could. But the bell goes, and you're jogging along. You're going sort of across several car parks, down the escalator, up the other end. And as you jog along, the whole conversation, the whole time is, what are we voting on? Does anyone know what we're voting on? No one knows what they're voting on. Now, my poor staff spend an awful lot of time working out what we're voting on because we don't get whipped by anyone else. So we don't have helpful little messages on our Blackberries telling us which way to vote. Um, and I have seen my colleagues literally being pushed into the I lobby or the no lobby, even as they're still remonstrating with their whips, saying, I'm not quite sure that I want to vote this way. But actually, they just, they just get pushed into the yes lobby or the no lobby. And the tradition is that once you've been pushed over that line, you're not allowed to reverse out again. So you have MPs literally hiding in the toilets in the yes lobby and the no lobby because they don't want to go through and be counted at the other end because they realize they've either gone into the wrong lobby or don't want to be counted for, for voting in what they don't believe. Anyway, all of that is a long introduction to say that one of the cross-party issues we've been working on is to try to make it mandatory 
to include a short explanatory statement that will explain the purpose of an amendment. So that when you look at your order paper, it doesn't say in paragraph 5, little 3.2, replace and with or, which frankly doesn't mean very much unless you've done quite a lot of homework to work out what it's talking about. It will tell you exactly what you're voting about. And I think what was so interesting about this very modest change, which not only is desirable in the European Parliament, it's actually mandatory in the European Parliament that you should provide such an explanation. But when, I, when we, this cross-party group, suggested this modest amendment, you'd have thought we suggested you know, the, the end of the world. The whips were furious, and they were furious because it would take power away from them, telling them which way the, you know, their, their, their party members, which way they have to vote, and give some power back to the, to the backbenchers. It was partly successful. We got it agreed on a pilot basis, on a voluntary basis. You know, so it's not mandatory yet for everybody to write those explanatory statements, but it is, it's getting there. It's a step in that direction. It's a voluntary thing. I know that sounds a very small thing, but actually it's about trying to get some of the power away from the whips because my other observation about Westminster really is that the whips have so much power and it is so dysfunctional as a result. And if we could have a few more MPs just engaging their brains a little more often before they go and vote rather than simply following the party line, we might just get a slightly better parliament. Well, on the cross-party thing, can I say that uh, the, the Green Party are seen as being very consensual in the Scottish Parliament. We praise where it's appropriate and we're uh, hopefully constructive uh, when we do criticise. I'll give you an undertaking that uh, Alison, John, Patrick and myself have agreed never to hide in toilets when there's a vote, um, <laughs> or after we've voted indeed. Um, but. Um, it is important, and there is a challenge there for understanding because, you know, I, I spent four hours scrutinizing um, legislation the other day there. It can be very involved, and it is sometimes, sometimes the Scottish Government will give a, a document uh, saying the purpose and effect, uh, the purpose of an amendment and the effect it would have. Um, so there are challenges connected with that. Um, on on the, the question of how we challenge these big six, well, I, I would like to think, as I, I keep saying, that you know, if, if we start from the bottom up, there are challenges about um, renationalising, but if, if communities, the aggregate effect of communities building up over time, I think would be very compelling. The issue of divestment is extremely important. Um, and I applaud Glasgow University and I applaud the, the, the students of Uni Edinburgh University and many um, my Green colleagues and I went up and were part of the occupation when the security let us in. Um, and they've, they've done very well at highlighting issues. Um, I hang my head in shame by saying that, um, unlike Caroline, we have managed to secure, and I have been leading for our group on getting into the Parliamentary Pension Fund, and we do know that we can all stand up in the chamber and puff our chests out and say we're doing everything about health equalities whilst um, uh, there's considerable sums of money invested in fossil fuels, tobacco, and shamefully the arms industry. So we have a way to go there, but if Mr. Carney, the Governor of the Bank of England, thinks there's um, light in the horizon, I think we should go towards that light, and I think that's the way, hit them where the money is. Okay, we'll take another couple of questions. There's a, a chat down there, and I'm looking right the back and left-hand corner there. Super, that's great. Uh, so what do you, uh, you both think about uh, the national debt? Um, we're anti-austerity, aren't we? So uh, can national debt go as high as we like? Um, it, would it help to sort of break it up into its component parts? Would that help us to think about it in a different way, or...? What do, you, what do you guys think? Can you tell us your name as well, sorry? Sorry, my name's Tommy. Tommy, thanks. I had one more. Oh, right at the back, number three. <laughs> hey, um, my name's Shalene, or Joe, if you want. And obviously today's national, sorry, World Mental Health Day, just for anyone who didn't know that. It's just, this question is kind of appropriate today. Um, I was wondering, first, what you have done second what you are doing third what you would like to do in your respective parliaments to try and resolve mental health issues thank you okay john you want to start with him well the, the, there's been a, a reshuffle in the scottish parliament and for the first time there is a, a minister with exclusive responsibility for that it's jamie hepburn and i think you're right to say that there are, there are a number of issues around the provision of mental health um, and um, it, it is very much the postcode lottery and of course diagnosis 
um, is, is quite often a challenge and uh, there, there, there are uh, again significant issues ab about that. I think the approach of assessing individuals' needs and then putting in place mechanisms to, de de to deal with these needs seems to be fairly fundamental. Um, although I have to tell you, I've had senior council officials tell me, yes, we're obliged, a statutory obligation to assess the need. We've no obligation to meet that need. Now, there's a, a integration of health and social care uh, taking place. Um, it's a different, there's different models. Highland has a, 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 a unique model, like a lot of things kicks it off, but there are opportunities there um, to have a more, uh, a broader uh, understanding of the, uh, of mental health issues because of that, and uh, um, I, I think that um, it's, a, it's a very strong le lobby, the, the lobby in, um, for mental health, uh, those who suffer from it, and of course we know that a significant proportion of us at some time during our lives do have uh, mental health issues, so I have to say it's something that's very much on the radar, and, and it's a very strong lobby that's there. Um, the first one was national law. Yeah. Well, I think Patrick summed it up very well. Um, we've, we've changed things around. We, we, the the um, media have joined in with the, the Conservatives and indeed the Labour Party, who many forget, uh, um, certainly at the last count, were signed up to about 93% of the so-called austerity cuts, many of whom voted for a welfare cap as well. So, um, you know, they may have a, a man of principle as their leader, but I don't know that that's necessarily reflected in the way that um, they're going to... Uh, continue, and certainly if they're to win Middle England, which I understand is always their goal, um, then um, I think they'll be one to keep Mr. Corbyn quiet. Um, we all incur debt. Anyone that's got a, a house they've paid for has debt. It is a question of proportionality, and uh, the, the, the debt can be more than um, financial, I would say. The debt, uh, there's a debt to society from spending um, $1.43 in the early design of a, a, a weapon system that people call weapons of mass destruction. I prefer to call weapons of indiscriminate civilian slaughter, which is exactly what they are. Um, so... That would be a national debt. And, and, you know, politics is about priorities. And the priorities, funnily enough, that the UK elites, and they are the bankers, the generals, the public school boys, are very gender specific there, are different from priorities we would have, and indeed priorities for the people of Scotland. And it's, it's important that uh, we, we don't fall into the trap of thinking that what we're hearing from the, the, the Mail, the Express, the Telegraph, the rest of them is the way it's always been. Uh, I'm no economist, but I do know that people, there's evidence in the past to show that people are not averse to paying taxes. I recall when taxes, uh, when I would have started working, it was 33p in the pound. People can't be sold in having Nordic style of uh, social services and US levels of uh, taxation. We, we need to work hard to change that around. To start off with the question about mental health, which I think was a very, um, a really well made question. Um, I, I think that we need to do something about the resources, the inequality of resources that goes to mental health compared to physical health. You've got many politicians who will use that phrase talking about parity of esteem, which is supposed to mean that you take physical health and mental health equally seriously. But we know if you look at the allocation of resources, of financial resources, they're not being taken seriously and, and equally, and that people who have mental health problems have far greater difficulty in accessing the services that they need because the finance isn't there. So I think the first thing is around always arguing for greater financial support for mental health services, and that's something that I have been doing in Parliament. I think there's a whole issue around stigma, and actually there is somewhere that I would say that Westminster has done a little bit about. Um, there have been a couple of quite quite moving debates actually, quite, quite strong and effective debates where a number of MPs have talked about their own experiences of living with mental health problems and I think that's part of uh, a much bigger program of, of, of tackling some of the stigma associated with it. There's um, an, an amazing organisation uh, in my constituency in Brighton called Mind Out and it's um, for LGBT people who also have mental health problems and it's a wonderful charity organization um, and they do such brilliant work that I arranged for their director to come and meet with the health minister direct because I wanted to be able to spread the best practice whereby it's young people themselves who are peers who work as support workers alongside uh, people with mental health problems. They, they've had such a fantastic track record of inclusion and of on the whole, yeah, improving people's well-being, essentially. Um, and it's, it's a wonderful model that I would love to see um, spread out more widely. So th there was a really good meeting that we had with the, um, the health minister under the previous government that was Norman Lamb, which I have to say, I think personally, he is very committed to this, uh, to this issue. 
On the subject of, of the debt, I mean, as, as John said, Patrick put it very well this morning, John himself has, has put it very well. I mean, I, I think that what we need to do is stop fetishizing it, which doesn't mean being a debt or deficit denier. It, it means not making the eradication of debt the be-all and end-all of what we're doing in our economy, because when you do that, ultimately, you actually end up with some pretty skewed priorities. It's a bit as if you said a mortgage on your home is just absolutely appalling, so we've, let's pay off this mortgage in an arbitrary time of, you know, six months instead of six years or 16 years. That, that, you know, a mortgage, as long as you've got a way of paying it off over a period of time, isn't a problematic thing. It's actually a very sensible thing to have in terms of, 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 of investment of money. So I, I think that what we've got now is a government that is making the most of the fact that many people simply don't understand these issues. They then make it even worse by deliberately confusing people about the issues by pretending that the national finances are exactly the same as an individual's finances. And when an individual runs into debt, obviously they need to stop spending. That's because an individual doesn't generally go around taxing their colleagues. Uh, you know, governments can tax, they can invest, and one of the best ways of getting out of the, uh, of the financial problems that we have is precisely investing in jobs, getting people's taxes going back into the economy, rather than draining any kind of serious demand out of the uh, economy. And one of the best places to invest, of course, is in the green infrastructure, the energy efficiency, the renewable energies that we so desperately need. And, you know, the criminal thing about this is that there are so many win-wins that you could have if you had, for example, a mass program of home insulation. You would create hundreds of thousands of jobs which would do you know, huge benefit to the economy, but you would also get people's fuel bills down, which would be great benefit to them, and you wouldn't have such high fuel bills, and you would also be doing something for climate emissions too. I was just going to end by saying that um, I was on a delegation to um, Athens earlier this week um, and met with a wonderful woman who um, used to be the speaker of the previous Greek parliament. And she was describing how she had set up what she called a truth committee on public debt. And it was a rather amazing process, a very open process, where people could you know, bring forward their own thoughts as well as having experts on the panels. It was all done in public, and essentially it was asking the question, you know, how serious is the Greek debt? Where did it come from? Who was responsible for it? Where is it owed to? And you know, the clarity she was able to bring with that report was incredibly helpful. And I would love to see us here in this country having a debt um, uh, committee, a truth committee on, on the public debt and austerity in the UK. And maybe we could just use that to stop George Osborne pretending that this was a problem caused by public spending rather than a problem caused by the greed of a number of financial institutions and banks. So if we had that, I think that would be a very good tool in the, uh, in the fight going forward. Okay, don't, I think we'll have time for just two more questions, so this will be the, the last ones, unfortunately. Um, lady down the front there and a gentleman at the back with the stylish beard. Yeah, all beards are snazzy. They're all very cool. I have to admit, I'm a huge beard fan my, myself, so I agree <laughs> with you on that one. Um, hi, guys. So I'm, my name's Ellie Kepler. I'm a new member, um, and I feel... <laughs> I, I feel very passionately about politics, I have done all my life, but as a young woman of colour, I feel kind of scared to get involved in the big shots of the political games because I, I've, I've heard that, especially at the Westminster Parliament, the issues of sexism and the issues of downgrading um, members who are speaking in chambers is a very, very serious issue. So I suppose what my question is the same to both of you, how do you tackle the issues of sexism and racism in both of your respective parliaments? And how do you go about ending that and extrapolating that into the wider society? Thanks very much. Thank Thanks for the beard comment, by the way. <laughs> I think the Green Party probably has the nicest beards. Look at that. I mean, seriously. <laughs> I've, been, I've been at the Fringe events this afternoon, and I got complimented in the last Fringe about my beard as well, so I really appreciate that. Um, can I just say, I think there's one reason Caroline Lucas got voted in. It's because you're bloody brilliant. My question is quite simple. Uh, my job is to lead a charity uh, in Scotland called the Trussell Trust. Uh, 
we provided food to 117,689 men, women and children in Scotland in the last financial year. I have a question for both Caroline and for John. Does the Green Party uh, at UK level have a policy position on the current levels of food poverty? And uh, the same would apply to John for the Scottish Greens. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, yeah, well, congratulations to the Trussell Trust for all that you're doing. And, you know, what a, what a scandal that you have to be doing it, really. It feels that in the sixth richest country in the world, you know, the idea that, that food banks are now back with a, with a vengeance just seems to be a, a, an absolute indictment on, on, on government choices. Um, but yes, we certainly do have a, a strong view around, around food poverty and, and the fact that um, it's not just that people don't get enough food, but the food that they do often get isn't nutritious and isn't good quality food and therefore people's health is in question as well. And I think we're tackling it on a number of, of levels. I mean, first and foremost is to keep fighting the welfare cuts that this government is pursuing because although the government will often say food banks have been here for decades, as you will know, the numbers using them have increased massively. And, you know, some of the policies that are leading to that, and, and this is what I've heard anyway, and I'd be interested to, to speak to you afterwards, but it's quite clear that some of the policies, you know, for example, the benefit sanctions, the way in which if you're sanctioned for some stupid reason, because, and, and we've heard such awful reasons that people get sanctioned, you know, if, they're, if, if you know, their child was sick so they couldn't get to the benefits office, then they can get sanctioned for that. And it can take weeks to get it back on stream, to get their money back again. And my office spends a lot of time trying to get people who have been benefit sanctioned to get some finances going back so their kids are literally not going hungry. And, and as I say, this is the sixth richest country. This is an absolute scandal. So part of it is about fighting that issue on the, on the welfare side. Part of it is making you know, some, some really lovely connections that are being made between the incredibly um, huge waste that is happening from all through our food chains, in, in fact, but, but often the supermarkets are the place where it's most visible, and making sure that there is a link, as there has been now with some law in France, whereby those surpluses at the supermarket are not thrown away, even worse, they are not tampered with to stop someone eating them when they are still in, in um, you know, still perfectly good quality. And trying to square the circle whereby, for example, there's a wonderful project in Brighton called the Real Food no, sorry, the junk food project. Um, and what they do is take that food that otherwise the supermarkets will be disposing of and they make it not just into giving it to people who don't have food, but they, they celebrate it in a wonderful restaurant where they use it to make the most amazing meals. People can go there who can afford it and if you can afford it, you pay for it and if you can't afford it, you don't. But the lovely thing about it is, is that everyone is there together and it's actually a celebration of community as well as about ensuring that we get food to people who, who need it. What was the other question? Sexism and racism, I'm so sorry. But, um, well, we need people like you, obviously, please. Um, and, 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 and it is... It is slowly getting better, but not fast enough. Um, um, and all I can say is that I think all of us, and I need to be better at it myself, is when, you, when we see it, we have to call it out. And I vow here and now that if I do ever see it, because I have to say I haven't personally seen the, the, you know, the jiggling of the, of the, of the breasts of you people pretending to do that when a woman is speaking in Parliament. Plenty of my colleagues have, and they've told me about it. Uh, but but if, if it ever happens, then I promise now that I will get up, I will call the point of order, I will go and take the mace out of Parliament if necessary and absolutely say that that is unfair, unjustifiable action. Now, John's, John's only going to have 45 seconds, so we'll see if he can speak faster than he did in his two-minute speech earlier. Well, f first and foremost, um, I think there's great work done in connection with the, the food banks. I, I, I think we have a, a growing narrative around the deserving recipients of public support and undeserving, and I, and I think that's played into that. Um, I, I, I think there are real challenges about normalising the fact that we require food banks. I've seen them, you know, visited my home area of Lochaber, Orkney, Badnach and Suspe. It's sad in many respects. The community effort that's behind that is tremendous. But I have to say, you know, I, I don't suppose Mr. Osborne or Mr. Cameron and Julie uh, are affected by that. Maybe that's what they consider the big society. Um, as regards sexism and, and racism, I, it's incumbent on all of us. It's incumbent on all of us to challenge that. I, I've been involved in racial equality, equality issues, human rights for, for, for a long time. And I think there are bodies, SEMVO in Scotland, uh, which encourages greater ethnic minority 
um, um, involvement in all aspects of public life, because this, this is about empowering people, this is about encouraging people to come forward. I always say there's far too many that look like me, middle-aged, gray-haired men in suits, and we need the broad range, and I think you see that in the Green Party, and I would certainly encourage you to get as active as possible. We've come to the end of our session um, and I just wanted to share with you some wisdom that I learned. This is a big stage and uh, having not spoken at a conference before, I, I googled, you know, how to feel comfortable on stage and I, I took some tips from the, the Tory party conference and supposedly you've got to stand a bit like this. <laughs> that looks good. So we're out of time. Caroline has a book, um, but John has a mug with his mug on it. Do you have any? No. Caroline, however, will sign some of her books. She's got to go and get a train, so may not get through them all, but I'm sure she'll do her best um, out, out in the front in the foyer there. But please um, show your appreciation for our speakers, Caroline Lucas and Mr. John Finney.